Join me, 48 Hours Correspondent Erin Moriarty, on my podcast, My Life of Crime, as I take on true crime investigations like no other. This season, I'm looking into the labyrinth of crime and secrets within families. I'm cutting straight to the evidence and talking to the people directly involved, including investigators and the families of victims. Listen to My Life of Crime with Erin Moriarty wherever you get your podcasts. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. Welcome to the Bear Naked ABCs, and this week we will not be reviewing one particular song. We have a special episode this week as we are pushing our next song off by one week, and... Speaking of one week, we are very fortunate today to be talking with the person who produced the band's most profitable hit, as well as their most profitable album, an album that is near and dear to my heart. I am, of course, talking about Stunt. Stunt. (laughs) I am so glad to be talking with her during this 20th anniversary year. Not only was she one of the few women producers, engineers, mixers, and audio electronic technicians at a time when it was unheard of, but also one of the best in general in determinative of all of that. Long before the Bare Naked Ladies, she began her career by working on five Prince albums, including starting with easily his most famous album, I think, Purple Rain, an album that ranked number six on the Rolling Stones' top 500 albums of all time with so many hit songs on that album i don't know where to even start but to (laughs) give a few purple rain let's go crazy i would die for you take me with you and to bring us back to bare naked ladies a song that deeply influenced them enough that it was a part of their early career in their early live shows and we'll discuss this four years from now when we actually reach it alphabetically (laughs) They recorded it as part of the radio show contest, When Doves Cry. She was also a producer for David Byrne from Talking Heads and another band that keeps popping up on our podcast, The Odds, who, as you guys may remember, Mm -hmm. have been backing Steven on his last couple of solo albums. And their leader, Craig Northey, joined Steven on his last tour and on this next upcoming tour. On Discogs.com, She is listed on over 150 different albums and singles in some way, shape, or another. India RE, The Jacksons, Rusted Root, Toad the Red Sprocket. I'm going to mess this name up. Gigita. Did I get it right? Gigita. Gigita. Okay. (laughs) Thank you for the correction. I always mess up someone. And Tricky. But that 20 years was just the first part of her career. Because afterwards, she left producing to go get her doctorate from McGill University in Montreal and is now a professor of music production and engineering. Her research focuses on auditory memory, the perception of musical signals, and the influence of musical training on auditory development. She is the director of the Berkeley Music Perception and Cognition Laboratory. She teaches music production, music theory, and a number of other classes. As a Personally, as a past psychology major myself, I would love to spend hours talking to her about all the different things with music and cognition, but we don't have that much time. So, (laughs) (laughs) But if that weren't enough, she and a former student, Matthew MacArthur, launched Boston's first nonprofit recording studio, The Record Company, to offer low-cost recording facilities to area musicians and free music technology instruction to area teens. I could spend the rest of our time just listing her accolades, but I think you would rather hear, and I know I would rather talk with, the woman, the myth, the legend, (laughs) Susan Rogers. Thank you today for joining us, Susan. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Oh, yeah. I will. We are, too. (laughs) 
I, I know that Aaron's probably geeking out just about oh, as yeah. much as I am today. <laughs> I, I'm the deep bare naked ladies fan. He is the deep music fan in general. So between the two of us, I, I know that I'm just trying to hold back all my anxiety right now. <laughs> Aaron is our, our music geek on the show. Went to college for music specifically. So jazz, is that right? Well, uh, it's a jazz school, but I actually did major in audio recording. So this is quite a thrill to be able to talk to you. <laughs> it's really, it's very cool. So yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Rogers, or, or should I call you Susan? I, I don't want to presume. Oh, Susan, yeah. Susan's great. It's, it's wonderful to meet you. Um, and I want to thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. Um, it, it, I know it's valuable, and uh, it means a lot to be able to talk to you. It's a real pleasure to talk with you guys. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about the ladies, whom I love oh, yeah. so much, and uh, just talk about the days in the studio. That's a really happy memory for me. Good times. I can only imagine. Yeah. <laughs> well, and of course, we love the uh, we love the ladies here. So you know, it's <laughs> it's a pleasure yeah. for us to be able to talk to someone who's who's had such a intricate relationship with them and and work so deeply with them. So it's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm going to start with a correction. You mentioned that I teach music theory, but I don't teach music theory mm. because I'm a non-musician. I don't know music theory. I can find middle C on a piano, and I, 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 I can if I do the F A C E or the Every Good Boy Deserves, deserves Fudge. fudge. <laughs> <laughs> I can read nice. music notation. No, what I teach is uh, record production and recording engineering. I also teach music cognition and psychoacoustics at Berkeley, but I leave the music to the kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. I was going to say, Susan, uh, Tracy's heard me talk about psychoacoustics several times already on the show. So like when I heard that you were involved with cognition and the psychology behind audio, I was really, really super excited to talk to you about that because that's something that's always fascinated me, just how much of music and sound happens in our minds, not our ears, uh, is terribly fascinating. Absolutely right. If I had only known that when I was in the business, if I had only known how the path from the ear up to the cortex changes what we hear mm -hmm. i don't know that i would have been able to do my job any better because naturally when we're making records we're making a musical object not not thinking about theory and we're not thinking about uh, how to make it perfect we're, we're, we're thinking on a deeper level but nonetheless there were some things that i knew how to do by practice and i think most engineers do but now i know what i was doing now that I have that education, I, I know what I was doing. That's kind of cool. For example, I was just talking with students this afternoon about that. So the, the, the brain compares the signal from the left and right ears to look at the time of the signal, and it compares to look at the phase of the signal reaching the two ears and to look at the level differences. So when I worked in the studio, if I was mixing, I really liked to take a face and make it perceptually just a little bit wider because it mm -hmm. was pleasing to me but so what you do is you have to take the bass and you have to copy it or electronically make a copy of it we could do that easily now with mm. digital workstations in the analog days you'd have to you, know, you have to patch it right so you got the two identical bases but you take your second bass let's say it's the one that's panned slightly right and you delay it by just a millisecond or two and that's going to shift the stereo image over to the left unless you compensate by raising up that level. And then it's going to pull the stereo image a little closer to the right. So what you end up getting is a slightly wider than normal base. And those sorts of tricks become the sonic signatures of audio engineers and mixers, just like every director is going to have those visual signatures or cinematographer will have those signatures. This is what their films look like. Likewise, for record makers, we have a we got a thing that we like, and this is what our records sound like. That's a cool a, a cool notion, the notion of us record makers forming these internal templates for what good is, and then just like a chef would in the kitchen, just satisfy your own taste. <laughs> yeah, that's really fascinating. I completely agree. This is something I've witnessed um, myself doing when I reflect upon it, as well as uh, other people I know who work in, in the studio, uh, you just kind of develop your own rhythm and your own kind of little idiosyncrasies. And you can kind of tell, oh, I think that was probably mixed by Aaron because he, he you know, <laughs> tends to have his highs a little crispier or whatever. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I think now in preparation for this interview, I wish I had had more time, uh, Susan, but I did watch a few interviews with you. 
Uh, you were at the Loop uh, Music Festival by Ableton. You gave a wonderful talk that I really, really enjoyed. And I, I read a couple of interviews as well. And I, I, I read, uh, I can't recall where it was, but you were talking about having worked with Prince and how particular he was, like taking the, uh, taking the mids out of the bass drum and things like that, that you feel like his flavor was sort of like indelibly mixed onto yours for a while after that it was just so strong you know what i mean uh, <laughs> you talk a little bit about like what it was like working with him oh yeah i could talk for weeks about what it was <laughs> like working with him for sure uh it's important that the listeners recognize that prince was no mere mortal <laughs> <laughs> so true. Uh, his output of of how prolific he was as a writer in terms of uh, his the, the breadth of his talent, both the breadth and the depth. So he mm. could play drums in a way that would just make your jaw drop, not just play them acoustically, but program a drum machine. He was a genius with rhythm. But then he'd move from that instrument over to bass, and he'd just be killing you. He'd just be killing you. <laughs> and remember, we worked during the days of analog tape, so there's no oh, yeah. scroll. Yeah editing there there's no pitch <laughs> correcting there's no time in correcting what you hear on those records is it's a guy with an instrument in his hands and it was wow. usually one take if we stopped it was typically because he changed his mind about a part not because he made a mistake it was ridiculously good and then he moved from that instrument to keys and to guitar and be just as good there and then he'd get on vocals <laughs> Oh and yeah, <laughs> just as good. And you'd be thinking, how can this one person be this this deeply, deeply skilled? Uh, the, the short answer to that, which is an incomplete answer, the short answer is that as a teenager, he was um, he spent a lot of time alone. He spent a lot of time alone, alone with instruments and teaching himself to play. To this degree, I, I pause and I hesitate a little bit because part of his teenage years were really sad and really lonely. I've heard stories, right. both firsthand and secondhand, of him being abused by his stepfather, being locked in a bedroom, and I mean, locked in a bedroom for a week at a time, where the kid would wow. just be just have he'd have nothing other than his instruments, and um, so from that great pressure, you know how pressure forms a diamond yeah. mm -hmm. from that great pressure a diamond was formed and when he did achieve escape velocity and was able to break out of that home life and was able to get a record deal as a teenager i think he might have been 18 or 19 but once you escape um that pressure launches you really far into your career and um he in the time when i was with him he did not stop i know he slowed down like any human being would a little bit later on but he had a very fast, very high trajectory for a very long time. Yeah, I just get chills thinking about him just laying down a drum track in, in one take and then moving along, picking up the bass and just putting the groove down and just move, putting that down and then going on the guitar. Like, obviously, a lot of records these days are made like that, but in many, many, many takes, patch, you know, punching in picking up uh, from wherever halfway through the solo yeah. over hours and hours of times and i can only imagine just watching this guy just going from one to another to another like a marathon and just, just jamming it right out uh, that has to uh, give you goosebumps to watch him you might assume that he had no self-doubt because mm -hmm. he he worked so quickly and uh you would be wrong if you assumed that uh, what he had was the capacity to hear arrangements in his head as he was writing a song, in the case of like dance music, or after he had written a song. So uh, he would write ballads, and some of his more important songs he wrote and then brought to the studio. Wrote them on piano, came up with the melody, mm. the expression, um, came up with the lyrics brought them into the studio and seemed to understand exactly how all the parts would go because he would take his lyric sheet and pin it up on a, like a mic stand or something in front of the drum kit. And without wearing headphones, because he's not playing to anything, he would play the song top to bottom on an acoustic drum kit. Wow. Fills the breaks, play the entire part top to bottom only listening to himself play it with the song in his head, the tempo and everything, the changes, the breaks, everything. 
and then he could come into the control room and lay down the bass part and, and gradually build the song up. Uh, that's why I said no mere mortal does that. <laughs> yeah. No, like he, so, he was definitively a musical genius. Oh yeah. He really, truly was. And uh, the other way he would sometimes work is if, it, especially if it was dance music, is just program a drum machine with a beat that he liked, and then figure out what the chord mm. changes are going to be. So he'd be composing through composing, you know, composing as he's as recording. And, and, and figuring out what changes he wanted. As I recall, he was usually in a slightly better mood when he was doing that, because mm. that's him just fooling around. That was the stuff that came out of him so easily. Um, the songs that were more complex, or that ended up being his bigger hits, that took more concentrated effort, were the things that took a little bit longer in the studio. By a little bit longer, I mean like a day and a half or two days as opposed <laughs> to three or four day. Oh, my goodness. I one day, I mean from the downbeat to the final mix. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. And um, then. Yeah. It's incredible. So taking that, like, he imprinted up upon you, much like ducks and, ant- and small animals imprint upon <laughs> each other. He, he imprinted upon you, especially during a very young formative age. Mm-hmm. So how did, and, and you were talking earlier about how each artist, each uh, producer and, and mixing audio artist has their own kind of signature and, and fingerprint. What did that look like for you that you brought to Bare Naked Ladies on stunt? Uh, Prince was the first album I ever recorded. I joined him as a maintenance technician and he put me in the engineering chair. So it was essential for me to learn his artistry. I knew the console. I knew signal flow. That was not a problem. I didn't have to learn how to use the equipment. I needed to learn what to do with the equipment, just like a, a, it'd be like taking a camera repairman and making him a cinematographer. Mm. Uh, like, yeah, I know how the camera works, but what does the director want? So uh, that I had to learn his ear. And it was Jesse Johnson from the time who sat down oh, with nice. me and showed me, here's how you always pan the hi-hat, and here's where you pan the rhythm guitar, and here's how he likes his drums to sound, and here's the right mm-hmm. reverb for the snare. And Jesse was great at that. So um, I, I was able to learn Prince's sound. Other Prince engineers, in particular, both Dylan Dresdow and Chris James, who worked with Prince after the 2000s, they said, you have to unlearn Prince. (laughs) When you get experience watching someone work that fast and be that good at performance and be that particular about his sound, now you've internalized that. And I was with him for a long time. So, and he and he was essentially my first one. So when I left Prince, I had his sound down pretty well. But what I did not have was an alternative indie or rock or pop sound. Hmm. And uh, I, I, I really worried about that. There was a period where my career really struggled in the late 80s and early 90s when I was trying to learn how to engineer, essentially. I'm trying to learn how to engineer anyone other than Prince. <laughs> And mm-hmm. I never worked as an assistant engineer, so I hadn't had the opportunity to watch other people work. So I was truly reinventing the wheel. But um, I had some. I worked with some good producers. I worked with Tony Berg and Matt Wallace and just a few others who helped teach me the the ear that they were listening for, and that that got me far enough along that by the time I worked with Bare Naked Ladies and worked with the Odds, I I could do pretty well. Uh, I think one of the things that really helped me in working with Prince is uh, having an ear for rhythm. I can imagine, yeah. An ear for drums and an ear for bass. So when I worked with The Odds or I worked with with, uh, Bare Naked Ladies or any other pop artist, they've got the top line covered. Mm -hmm. Those melody, and they certainly are such gifted musicians, all of them, that they know that they've got a lot of arrangement ideas. Uh, With me coming from a funk and a soul background, I can leave my ear down there in the basement where the bass and drums drums are and yeah. I'm listening for things that they might not be paying a lot of attention to. It fans you out. It makes you more well-rounded. It's interesting to hear you say that, Susan. And, and I think part of me listening to, to hear you describe your, your methodology and your, your ear for this is really helping me understand why Stunt is my favorite Bare Naked Ladies <laughs> album. Because 
uh, I'm a drummer, you know, uh, I, I play multiple instruments, but of the, the instruments that I play, the, the, the most confident I can say if someone says, could you play an instrument? Oh, I can drum. Uh, and I, I love playing the drums. For me, it's the most fun. It's, you just, there's something so primal about it. Um, so when I, when I hear music, I'm very often drawn to the drums. And I like a nice kind of like a poppy tight snare that you're hearing. And, and I just immediately think of like the drums coming in on alcohol. And I can hear that. And I'm like, oh, that's what I really like. Is that really nice? That you get a really great uh, establishment of the rhythm section there. And the bass and the drums coming together. And it just drives everything so so well. So... Uh, yeah, I certainly noticed that, and now that you mention it, it makes a lot of sense why uh, I'm drawn to the the sound in that album so much. Mm. Those guys let me do that. They um, when you when a producer takes an audition with a band, you're um, it's like a blind date often, yeah. and you're trying to describe what your kids would look like. <laughs> so, okay, well, this is my value system, and they're saying, "Well, this is my value mm-hmm. system." And you're saying if you're any good, what you should be saying is, this is what I'm good at, but you should also be saying, and here's what to watch out for with me, because here's what I'm mm. not at. Here's what I can't hear and what I can't do. And they should do the same. Here's what we need from you, because here's what we can't do for ourselves. So you have that conversation. And, and I, I think I said to all my clients then, what I'm good at is is going to be the rhythm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll be good. I'll be good with you there. What I will not be able to do is I will never be able to go to an instrument and sit down at a piano or pick up a guitar and show you here it should have these chords, <laughs> or it should have this voicing. I can't do that. Uh, if you need that, then you need a different producer. But what I can tell you is um, how what you're doing is making me feel yeah. and what it's mm-hmm. making me think of and where my mind is going and. That's not such a bad deal because for the majority of listeners, uh, they're not thinking about inversions and they're not thinking about music theory. They're thinking about whether or not this song is connecting with them. So I can Mm -hmm. say to you, I think uh, we've got too many instruments clustered up here in the melody. I think we need to spread this out a little bit. Let's get just, you know, some straight rhythm going down in the basement. Or this song is too rhythmic and we need somebody to get a little bit more harmonic. I've got an ear for that. So I make my contribution, and of course, with Bare Naked Ladies, being such gifted musicians, any idea that you think of, you throw something out there to them, and they're going to take the ball and run with it. They're, they're so <laughs> easy to work with, because at, at that point, they were just so, they were smart and um, and so adept at their instruments. Oh, yeah. It's fluid, that they're going to be able to give you a variety of e- expressions. Excellent, uh, Yeah. We were talking about kind of uh, the the study of the psychology behind consonants and dissonance. It reminded me of I, I took a very very uh, brief, too brief uh, look at your your doctoral thesis from McGill, and I was just kind of fascinated by this idea. And please correct me if I'm uh, at all misinterpreting uh, the research because I only gave it the the barest of glances, and I'd love to dive deeper into it if I get the time. But as I understand it. You are studying to see if, uh, at least as part of the, the, the study, if musicians could have a, a more precise or a more uh, reliable understanding of the perception of dissonance as opposed to non-musicians. Because to a non-musician, uh, one might think, well, they just hear, that sounds good, that sounds bad. Whereas a musician has been diving into, here's the Western diatonic scale as I know it, and does this fall within what I perceive to be whatever? And more kind of analyzing the, the intervals. Uh, could you, I, I know it's like a 200-page doctoral thesis, but could you, <laughs> could you briefly talk about it? Because I think it's a fascinating topic, and I'd love for you to be able to share that with our listeners. Thanks. I was very interested in the origins of consonants and dissonance. Uh, uh, Pythagoras was interested mm-hmm. in Euler and Leibniz and Helmholtz, and a lot of mathematicians have been interested at the heart of the question is, are some intervals naturally good? And I almost did an Ed Grimley voice from SC. <laughs> <laughs> is it the devil? Is it bad? One of my favorite intervals. <laughs> oh, no, I love Ed Grimley so much. I love Martin Schultz. So, is it bad? Is it the devil? Well, it used to be called diabolus in music. Uh, it was, as a melodic interval, the tritone was, as I understand it, beastly difficult to mm-hmm. sing. And as a simultaneous interval, somehow it just didn't sound as sweet as a perfect fourth and perfect fifth. So Pythagoras and and some of the mathematicians were saying, what's up with that? Why is it that the octave and the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth and these 
beautiful intervals that sound so sweet. Why are the tones of those intervals related to each other by small numbers? An octave is one to two, perfect fifth is two to three, and the perfect fourth is three to four. And then you get up there to the chi tone, which sounds kind of e, and <laughs> it's related by bigger numbers, 32 to 45. Mm. You get your minor sevenths and everything. So Helmholtz proposed in the 19th century that there'd probably be a physical, it's got to be a biological, physical reason for that. And it wasn't until the 1960s that Georg von Bekeshi showed that, yeah, it's our ear. So I am going to answer your question. But a little bit of a no, please, please, I'm fascinated. Our ear has an easier time of resolving, hearing apart frequencies that are nice and separated, just as our eye has an easier time resolving harmonious and nicely separated colors. If you see a friend approaching you from down the street and your friend is wearing a plaid sweater, <laughs> a good long distance you're going to be able to tell that it's a plaid mm. sweater if it's navy blue and red and white. But if your friend just happens to be wearing a plaid sweater that is blue and green and purple, from a distance, those are all gonna; those colors are all gonna blend in because their their the frequency separation is so narrow. Um, so blend right. in. It's gonna be hard to resolve the independent colors of that. You'll have to put your face right up to the sweater to see. So it's the same thing with musical intervals. Um, the tritone contains more closely spaced harmonics, and uh, those closely spaced harmonics cause interference in the inner ear, and it makes it it makes it just you know, just a little bit rough, just a little <laughs> bit, the way the roughness would be on your fingertips, um, a little bit rough like denim. Mm. So the, the tritone is denim and the octave is silk. Nice so, comparison, I love that. Yeah, so and the minor second and the major second have that low wah, 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 the amplitude modulation like corduroy, or, those are very rough. The question then becomes, what is the brain care? Is the brain care? Like, that's the ear. The ear shows us that there's a mechanical difference, but mm. is the brain care? And uh, chapters three and four in my thesis were interested in that question. So to answer it, I threw a whole lot of musical dyads, just two tones together, at the brain of musicians and non-musicians to see um, in an auditory short-term memory experiment which ones would stick. Mm. Brain treat them differently. And no, the brain doesn't really treat them differently. The only interval that didn't last in short-term memory really very long was the octave, probably because it's boring. Yeah. It's <laughs> boring. So uh, the difference between musicians and non-musicians, when we regard musical in intervals and when we regard music, is that musicians have this music tonal theory, Western tonal theory, mm -hmm. with which... To prejudge oh, okay. that tri tones dissonance. Mm -hmm. They that in theory this interval has been used since ancient times. Mm -hmm. they, Ooh, it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> and that our music evolved to regard the perfect fourths and fifths and the octaves as being sweet from the gods, right? So I just got an alert on my <laughs> I was just wondering if it was mine. So. No, it was mine. So from the gods, the consonant intervals are from the gods. They made that separation in the early days of music theory. And we now, human beings, society, have associations. Mm -hmm. We consider the minor seventh to be more dissonant than the minor third or the major third. In any case, for non-musicians without that formal training, it's all good. Yeah. It's so it's it's completely a learned behavior. Then it's a learned uh, uh, value that we're ascribing to it. That's really fascinating. To it's me. completely a learned behavior. So it has its sensory origins in the cochlea of the inner ear. There mm -hmm. are physical differences between right. rough and smooth. The consonant intervals as smooth and the dissonant intervals as rough. But it does not follow that that roughness is unpleasant. Mm -hmm. it's and it follows that denim is a worse fabric than silk. It just simply doesn't follow. They're just different. Mm -hmm. uh, that judgment of 
bad versus good, tension versus release, is something that has developed over time in our music culture. That's fascinating. I'm That's definitely really going to have to be, yeah, I'll be pouring over that for a while. <laughs> It but makes that, me think of one of the Beatles songs. I'm trying to remember exactly which one. It was written by George Harrison that is written in this dissonant type sound. Oh, I wish Har- I could just... Harrison pulled a lot from the Middle Eastern scales because he studied uh, over in India and he learned to play the sitar. And uh, so he came at things... It, it may, it, and that's interesting you said dissonant because that might sound dissonant to uh, a Western ear. But to someone who's been living in that area their whole life, that's completely natural. That's very harmonious. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's a really interesting example right there. Of a, well, and I've, I've heard people like that have studied music. Mm-hmm. They don't like that sound. They don't like that <laughs> song. And, and they say, like, ah, it, it just bothers me to hear this, this song. And for this exact reason, I'm trying to pull it up now as I'm speaking at the same time. And... To me, it's one of those songs that I absolutely love because of that that feel that it gives you. It, mm. it, it's giving you the anxiety um, while listening to it, and I get the feeling that that is what's yeah. meant to what is meant to evoke um, as it's going through it. Um, I want to tell you. Oh, um, oh yeah, okay. And, it, and it's a song about anxiety, about like whether or not to meet this girl. And so, like, I I love that that matches up with like the lyrics. And but I've also heard other people that have listened to that that have been trained in music, been like, oh, that just that that grates on me. So well, I'm wondering if that's connected to what you were just yeah. saying. Knowledge influences perception. When we know something about a thing, we look mm. at it, or taste it, or smell it, or. Uh, hear it differently. Knowledge definitely influences perception. So it goes from the top down as well as going from the bottom up. A perfect example of a study that underscores this point was done at McGill while I was there and they recruited me to be one of the non-musicians because it's so hard to find non-musicians in Montreal. Anyway, (laughs) musicians and non-musicians in our ability to recognize beginnings and middles and ends of classical compositions. Not well-known ones, because that would have the jig would have been up. But uh, they took some unknown classical compositions that were very, very obscure, and they segmented. They, the researchers, segmented these pieces, beginnings, middles, and ends. And uh, I think, as I recall, you look at the laptop, and there were sticky notes, and you just click on these sticky notes, and it would play the sound file. And I gotta tell you guys, for the life of me, it was one hundred percent guesswork. Oh, really? I had no idea. Every wow. song I heard, I remember thinking to myself, I can imagine that as a beginning. Yeah, I could, I could see ending in that. That could be a middle, too. There wasn't one example in there that I clicked on and I thought to myself, oh, that's definitely a beginning. I simply <laughs> didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, without that formal musical training, mm. I've got no a priori assumptions about how music should yeah. go. I know how it does go because I've listened to a lot of it, but I don't know how it should go. So when you ask a beginner, they say all things are possible. And for those of us without that training, when we hear something new, whether it's a new interval or a new sound or a new timbre or breaking some formal rules of music, we're like, yeah, I, I can imagine that. That could work. Now, it could actually be quite bad for a record producer because you might suggest things that, uh, and I've done this before in the studio, suggested things that I thought were a simply fine idea. And uh, <laughs> other people later realize, no, that's not such a fine idea. It's actually, pretty bad. Do you mind awfully if I ask for an example? I'm just very oh, curious. Oh, sure. Sure. There was, I don't remember the title of the song, but it was on a tricky album. And this mm-hmm. was the, the album is called Angels with Dirty Faces. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Trick I know the, album. the studio together, and I was, I was mixing for him, and the way he mixes is he just gives you a whole lot of tracks and asks you to just pick some and put them together. And uh, it was kind of dangerous because we were both non-musicians in the studio making an album. <laughs> and there was one song in particular where he started it in one key, and then he had some other musicians come in, and they played it in a different key, and my mix blended those two keys. And uh, it was really, really dissonant. And I thought, oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> I really regret that decision. I should not have 
that. I can't listen to it today. And I'd tell you the title if I remembered what it was, but you can find it easily enough on the <laughs> tricky album. That's really interesting. And, and I also I remember uh, Kevin Hearn on the on the stunt album wanted yeah. to When You Dream as just as Steve, Steven's vocal over just, you know, this wash of noise in the background. And I was into it. I, I, that's what I wanted. But the rest of the band and the label as well, they wanted more structure. So they wanted... Kevin strikes me as one of the more experimental members of the band, definitely. Uh, yeah, I've got a I've got a nice appetite for that. Um, but <laughs> eh, to, my de- to my detriment. Uh, it's, it's, uh, another good analogy is food. Um, hmm. There are some chefs who are willing to try really experiment with with different flavors, but um, most diners don't want a lot of experimentation. Mm, true. Anticipating that very there's small be, variations on the comfort. Uh, yeah, there's going to be familiar flavors in here, so you can sprinkle on a couple of little things, but don't go making a meal out of really unusual <laughs> flavors. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Now, what were some of your? Okay, oh, I jump in real quick, Aaron. Yeah, please. I know I'm like I'm tweaking <laughs> out over here, so go ahead. What was so you, you talked about like when some of the the times that didn't work out so greatly, but you also brought something to this album to stunt specifically that was very different than past producers, I think, and that you had like that feel like, like you had talked about in other interviews of the global overall impression rather than like the specifics of this chord here or that change there about how music in general is making you feel and bringing that to it. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the the uh, successes that you had on stunt that you brought in as a person who didn't have a ton of music theory behind you, um, but you had all this ex- this understanding of like how it made you feel and the global overall impression um, and and some suggestions. I know you made some suggestions with alcohol on like mixes and fills that you recommend throwing in there, but could you talk a little bit? about some of those things that you you had uh, suggested that worked out pretty well. Because I also know the band came to you saying, we want this to sell big in America. We want to we want to break into America. And that was your Mission major accomplished. <laughs> focus mm-hmm. for this album. And it, it succeeded amazingly. Oh, yeah. uh, I was so grateful that they came to me. The record changed my life. Uh, when I first encountered Bare Naked Ladies, their music uh, was a bit like the Beatles in that it was top-heavy with melody and harmony. Mm. Now, melody and harmony are hard to write. So if you're top-heavy with melody and harmony, you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> but in the United States, the music that uh, our music uh, that, that has come up from this country has been, compared to Canada and England and Australia, has been more influenced by the rhythm. So uh, the Beatles were top-heavy, but the Rolling Stones were more like a square because they had they had melodies, but they, if anything, the Rolling Stones might have been a little bit more bottom-heavy because they studied the blues, and yeah. the rhythm uh, was, was where they started from, just like uh, American blues music and then American R- R&B and, and roots music. So in order to sell to an American audience, it was necessary to really focus on the rhythm section. And as I said before, that's something I have an ear for. And to, to just to bring a little bit more soul to them and add weight to the bottom, add weight to the drums and add weight to the bass by yanking them away from what the top line, the melody and harmony and the vocals were doing. That necessitated getting Tyler into a groove uh, with fewer fills. Mm, yeah. In the, 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 yeah, the that's a good point. Rock music goes small verse, big chorus, small verse, big chorus, bridge is kind of in the middle, bigger chorus, and <laughs> that's that's rock music. Yeah. But R and B soul music doesn't have that dynamic. R and B and soul music builds ecstasy by getting into a pocket and then slowly ramping, and after three, four, five minutes, you're ecstatic. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a rhythm based emotional connection to music. So uh, I worked with them a little bit on that on that rhythm section, and let's just get in the pocket and let's see if we can't just stay there and get that feel and let and keep that anchor down there in the basement and let these guys drift up here at the top and add those gorgeous melodies and harmonies and vocals. 
So it was just, it was taking them more from a top heavy pyramid, an upside down pyramid, and just making it more of a square. Standing <laughs> it out this direction. That, you know, based that, on that's really you... putting it in a great way for someone who's who's not musically talented or <laughs> doesn't have a ton of music theory in me, but can understand it and kind of put to to visual. Yeah, and based on your description <clears throat> of your particular aesthetic, Susan, I think you were a perfect choice then for this album. Oh, thanks. Uh, the we know from psychology that uh, there are three basic pathways through which people bond to music or get that ecstasy feeling. Uh, one can be from the rhythm. Uh, another can be from the melody and the harmony, and then a third can be just cognitively. Music can make you think, and that mm. might be lyrics or that uh, makes you think that you love this song. Uh, my first love has generally been the rhythm section. Um, I've grown a greater appreciation for lyrics as I've gotten older. I'm just recently getting into Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell, and, which is very, very, very embarrassing because I should have been smart enough to have gotten into them when I was young. I wasn't that smart. Uh, I, I like my stacks and uh, records from Muscle Shoals. I, I like, I like my, my soul stuff, my blues stuff. Just feels good. Um, but yeah, you don't. It's not necessary to be great at all three. So that's why Bare Naked Ladies had success and will always have success by the strength of their melodies and their lyrics. Uh, they're they're brilliant. Yeah. But if you add to that rhythm component, you're just picking up an audience that you might not have otherwise had, yeah. and and expand your audience base. Now, did you know? When you like, because there must have been a moment where you were listening to the playbacks or you after mixing or whatnot, and you heard one week. Did you have any idea how crazy that would blow up that song in particular? No, didn't know. But I got to tell you, Aaron, something that I've learned during the 90s, and I, I know for a fact now, is that when little kids and toddlers mm. like your music, you're in. That's because, a good point. Yeah. Oh, because toddlers are responding to not the cult of personality. They don't know if you're cool or It's completely hip. unbiased. Response. Right, it's unbiased. What they know is, does it have a catchy melody? Does it feel good to move to? And I remember hearing that rhyme, chickity china, the chum, <laughs> and remember thinking, this will be a hit in the yeah. playground. Yeah. And I didn't know hit in the playground. I didn't know then that that would translate to multi-platinum. But I actually should have known because with Gagita, their breakout single is a song called Whoever You Are, which is right around the same time. It was 96. And that the reason that song became a hit single was a bit serendipitous. But there was a big radio station programmer from Chicago, big station in Chicago, and she took her work home with her on a Friday night, which was a stack of CD singles. And she had to determine of this huge stack of singles which two were going to be added to her playlist on monday so she's making dinner for the wow. family and she's got these cds playing in rotation and when geggy toss whoever you are came on her little three-year-old toddler just stood in front of the speakers and just started dancing <laughs> and happy enough to recognize well if my baby likes this my audience is gonna like it <laughs> sure enough she added it uh, to the playlist on monday phones lit up the rest of the country then added the single and that's what caused wow. it successful. Yes. I've seen that with other examples as well. So, yeah, chickadee china. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Thank you. That's that's a great answer. Um, now, I have to ask. I know Tracy's probably going to want to throttle me because I keep going away from BNL. I love BNL. <laughs> I love the ladies. But, like, I'm I'm such a music nerd. And looking at Discogs.com, I was looking at all, all the records of your work here. There's two things that stuck out to me as a music nerd. And one was apparently you've worked with Laurie Anderson. Mm-hmm. Could you tell me what you worked with her on? I'm curious. It was an ill-fated project. Oh, no. It was ill-fated because uh, not all of the dominoes were close enough to to fall and touch gotcha. each other. But it was um, Moby Dick. It was a, oh, a wow. presentation of Moby Dick, and she had done the music for it, and the set was insanely beautiful. Yeah. And the actors that she had singing the lines were professionally voice trained. And and that ended up being not quite the right fit 
for what this music needed. Mm. It needed to be a little bit more rock and roll. And uh. it kind of weren't coming together, so she hit the pause button on that. This was late 99, early 2000, just when I was contemplating leaving the business. So uh, I was kind of making my exit as she was working with this ill-fated project. That said, <laughs> what a genius. Oh, she a is. Genius. She's she amazing. Is. How fortunate was I to be able to work with her? <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit of that right now, just being able to talk to you. So I appreciate uh, appreciate that. You've had such an amazing career. Your bona fides are in- intimidating, to say the least. There's one other thing that stuck out to me, and I want to make sure this is correct. Um, it, there's actually a small section for vocals for you. So, for instance, uh, um, from Sign of the Times, you did some vocals. Is that correct? Well, Prince would gather warm bodies, yeah, if we were around, and sometimes there weren't many of us around, because it would be four o'clock in the morning, and we'd been up all night, but yeah, he'd, he'd pull pull us, when I say us, it could be just whoever was around, whoever was visiting him in the studio, a girlfriend or something like that, or it could be myself, if we were working at uh, Sunset Sound, it would be me and Peggy McCreary, or Coke Johnson, or whoever was there, and you just get on the microphone, and off you go. That's awesome, and I see. Well, it says you you were on the you did some vocals for the reality of my surroundings by Fishbone. Is that correct? I don't remember it at all. Oh, okay, <laughs> I wasn't sure because I, oh, I didn't I, see. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Did you work with Fishbone as like a producer at all, or no? They uh, they were um, they were uh, in at Sunset Sound when we worked mm. at. Oh, okay, so that may have been studios something. there. Yeah, and the three studios all faced a common courtyard with a basketball hoop there. And so you'd be out in the courtyard. Dave Chappelle did a very famous skit of playing basketball with Prince. Oh, wow. Get involved yes. in or something like that. That playing basketball with Prince is what would happen in that courtyard. Oh, wow. That's wow. Sure. While he would be waiting for me to add <laughs> or finish something. And so sometimes you'd be out in that courtyard uh, while he was doing vocals, while Prince was doing vocals with the door shut because he did vocals all by himself. Mm. And someone would walk out of Studio One or Studio Two and they'd say, hey, can you come and be part of the group vocals? And you go, okay. And you just go in and you stand around the microphone <laughs> and you so sing. Cool. It's, a, it's a fairly common, yeah, it's a, it's a fairly common request in recording studios. Like, Hey, let's get some people in here. <laughs> well, that's very well, cool. Going off that disc, the discogs list, there was one that I noticed that, that kind of caught my attention. And that was the instant karma project, the tribute to John yeah. Lennon. What what was your part in that process in that in that album? I don't remember it. Um, Discogs has some errors in there too, uh, and then there's also the other possibility that sometimes you'll do a track and not finish it, move on to other things. The artist will then take that basic track, finish it with a different artist, maybe mm. like for example David Byrne um, did a record with Selena Gomez, and I'm credited on there. Uh, I never worked with Selena Gomez. I was not in the studio with her, but I was in the studio with David Byrne when we did that uh, track. So uh, people will tell me, you know, you did this song with Carmen Electra. And <laughs> thing. Something I had done the basic track as the engineer. So he kindly credited me, but it was finished after I left. So oh, tell me, what was the song that John Lennon? Um, well, it was a whole bunch of different songs. It doesn't say which song that you're listed as contributing oh. to. Uh, but I know that, that Bare Naked Ladies contributed to that, so I didn't know if it was part of that. It they did Oh, song. Yoko. Okay, well, no, I didn't work on that song, but it might have okay. been something. And then sometimes, this also happens, remember now I'm talking about memories that are thir- 25, oh, yeah. 30 years old, but sometimes you'll be in the middle of a record, the manager will contact the band and say, hey guys, there's this tribute thing. Do you have, can you take half a day? Can you take just half a day and bang out a song really fast for me? And we'll send it to somebody, we'll let somebody mix it. Can you do something like that? And you go, okay. And you just, you knock it out. You don't worry about contracts or things like that. Often it's for charity. So you knock it out and off the tape goes and you don't worry about it. So it could have been something like that. Uh, I either did it or I didn't, but I don't. <laughs> fair, that's a fair as answer as like we can get for that. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to interrupt you and bring us back to Bare ba- Naked Ladies. I was, I was about to, but you, you do it. <laughs> Please. Um, speaking of Bare Naked Ladies specifically, what was your most memorable experience from... St- I mean, we all know the alcohol 
story about like how that was recorded and that that was their naked track. But like I, I'm, you know, I'm more wondering like, are there any other like extremely memorable experiences that you have from that album with them? There were so many wonderful moments of camaraderie, and as usual with those guys, just laughter and tears. There was this one piercing dissonant thread of Kevin's illness. He was losing weight and not feeling well. And he had been to the doctor, but the, he didn't have a diagnosis yet. And there was the, this constant worry that like something's going on with him and we don't know what it is. On top of that, we had uh, Stephen, who uh, was in great shape, except that uh, his grandmother had just passed away and he had to leave us and fly home. And so th there was some, there was un unhappiness there. But on top of that, there was just this general feeling of optimism and excitement and joy. So it really was an album of joy and pain. Uh, there were just so many ridiculously funny moments. I mean, those guys, just they, they will not let up with the amount of laughing that you do when you're with them. It's just ridiculous. Uh, we moved very, very quickly. I only had three weeks to work with them, uh, and then I had another project. So not one week? Sorry, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> three weeks of working um, pretty nonstop. Uh, I don't think we took a day off. I was very happy there at Arlen Studios, and I liked the little cabin where they had me staying, which was right next to the studio. But the guys were in a, you know, a motel up the street, and they didn't particularly like this motel. So <laughs> it's okay. They weren't spending much time there. Most of the time we were we were in the studio. Uh, so, so the memories are, when I think of memories, it's just little flashes of funny things, mostly of laughing. I remember oh, this was so stupid, but <laughs> those are always the best like <laughs> things to remember. <laughs> so we had a bowl of these percussion instruments, which are just shakers, and they were shaped and made to look like fruit, but they weren't fruit. Mm -hmm. They plastic. You pick them up, and there's the apple and the orange, and there's the banana, and right. So we <laughs> had a bowl of fruit, and Tyler was going to play a percussion track, and Ed thought it would be really funny to put a real piece of fruit in there. So Ed and I are in the control room, and Tyler's on the other side of the glass, and he's and he's playing the banana or something like that. And Ed says to him on the talkback, play the apple. I think the banana is too high-pitched. Go for the apple. <laughs> Ed reaches over, and he grabs the apple and picks it up and shakes it in front of the mic. But what was funny was Tyler's reaction. It wasn't a very funny joke, but Tyler pretended like it was hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> Which made it so funny because it wasn't funny. It was just <laughs> stupid. And Tyler just made it hysterical. Moments like that, That's moments like that were just absolutely great. I remember uh, another moment that always stuck with me was Ed on the phone with, with I might have been the label. I don't think it, he it was the manager. I don't think it was Terry McBride. I think he was on the phone with the label. But the label wanted to do a very expensive video, quarter of a million dollars. And Ed, wow. yeah, very expensive. And Ed, being a young man at the time, was so brilliant on that phone call. And he's saying to them, and he's laughing as he's saying it, but he's saying no. He said, I have a family. I have a young family. I can't afford to spend a quarter of a million dollars on a video. We're just not doing it. It's just, it's a non-starter. It's not going to happen. That's my money and the band's money and our children's money that you're spending and we're not going to do it. And I was, I, I don't remember what I was doing. I was setting something up. So I wasn't far from him and I got to hear the bulk of this conversation. I was so impressed. He had the same ability that Prince had and that Tommy Jordan from Gagita had uh, of uh, being able to be a, a businessman without compromising any of his artistic integrity. Um, I, I remember moments like that that impressed me so much about them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, you so much great. for sharing that with us. Yeah, that's really cool. Not to make you choose between your children, but do you have a particularly favorite song off of Stunt? Oh, I think uh, Stephen knows that it's my favorite, but it's Call and Answer. Oh, nice, yeah. <laughs> uh, when Stephen came into town with Craig Northey just recently, you know, a few months ago, uh, 
Lee dedicated that one to me and played it. Oh, that's so sweet. I'm so happy to hear it. Uh, I love the song. I, uh, Stephen Page, that voice, those oh, melodies, lyrics. He just he just wipes me out. And they gave me great freedom with that song. Uh, great freedom. I mean, it was it was it was written, and the beauty of it is in the writing, uh, and of course in the performances. But they allowed me to chop up that second chorus and to end it a little bit sooner and go into that that solo with that nice chord change that uh, Kevin puts on piano. Um, they let me have my way with it. <laughs> I love it very very much. <laughs> Thank you. So you haven't met Michelle. She is our, our other co-host. She wasn't able to make it tonight uh, for work reasons, unfortunately. Um, but she had written some questions, so I hope you don't mind if we throw a few this way. I don't have any like big lead-ins or anything, so I just have her questions. Lightning round. Lightning round, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite song to work on from any artist? Mm. No, I don't know that I'd have a favorite. I, uh, I there is one though that kind of stands out. Um, the artist was Jeff Black on Arista, Arista Austin at that time. We did uh, the Jeff Black album at, at the Pedernales, Willie Nelson's other studio, this big studio out out there in Texas. The band was the band Wilco minus Jeff Tweedy, so it was the original Wilco. It was. Kenny Ray Coomer on drums and John Stewart on bass and the late, great Jay Bennett on uh, guitar. And then we had the brilliant, the man, uh, Greg Wells from Canada on piano and uh, and Jeff Black, singer-songwriter. And we did a song that was the title track on the album. It was called Birmingham Road. And those guys were so brilliant. And it came out so well that afterward, we just didn't want to go home. We came back into the control room, and, you know, this is not uncommon when you sit around after you've had a good day. You know, you might have a beer, and then you say, well, good night, everybody. We didn't want to leave. Mm. We all sat around, and we drank beer, and some of the guys were smoking joints, and we'd be listening, and we'd be talking about music, and every once in a while, Jay Bennett would just hold up his beer, and he'd go, play it again. (laughs) And and to sit there and listen to this six-minute song, and just hear it over and over and over again and love it. I still get that feeling when I listen to that song. The lyrics are brilliant. The performances are brilliant. Boy, it just gets me every time. Just absolutely loved it. That, that, that's as good as it gets in the studio. Fantastic yeah. answer. And yeah, as, as a creative person who has friends who are creative people, I know how hard creative people can be on their own work so yeah. frequently. So when you finally feel like you nailed something and you hear it and you're just like, Wow, that's really beautiful. It's such a powerful experience, I think, to be able to just really sit right. inside of that. Yeah. Yeah, you're so. right. Most of the time we walk out with great doubt. Yeah. Maybe we got it. Maybe we got it. And that is true of Prince, I know for sure. It's it's true of most people. Maybe we got it. But there are just those moments sometimes you realize Yeah. I don't even <laughs> want to pass judgment on this. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> yes, no, maybe doesn't matter. This feels so good. What a feeling. Just those rare moments. So her next question was, what was the most difficult song you ever worked on, any artist? Aside from Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. There were songs that were time-consuming, but ultimately turned out all right. I'm thinking of You Got the Look with Prince. That took many more days than than what he normally took to make a record. Certainly thinking of work with Gagita that involved so much experimentation. Whoever you are, their single, their their hit single, uh, went through quite a few different permutations before we finally agreed on it. We spent a lot of time massaging that record, but the outcome turned out. We were happy with how it turned out. In contrast, uh, there are records, I won't name the artist, but there are records I've I've worked on uh, where the artist was dropped from the label and the record was never released. And that is difficult for the reason, like, you're making it with this cloud hanging over your head. You're making it 
afraid that, oh, I don't think the label's going to like this, and you have this premonition that, oh, this isn't going to fly. Those are uncomfortable, even though artistically they might be satisfying. It just doesn't feel good. And then there was one, only one, I'm happy to say, artist I worked with. Again, I won't name her, but she was so difficult to work with because she didn't trust me. It turned out she hired me only because I'm a woman. Nobody else has hired me just for my gender. They hired me because they like the work I do. But this person didn't want to work with men and uh, hired me only for that reason. And she didn't trust me. And um, and that was, we never did finish the record together. It was wow. terrible. Wow. Yeah. Speaking of artists that you didn't work well with, <laughs> oh. her, are there any current artists that if you were to go back into doing producing or, or mixing that you would want to work with? Oh, it's going to sound like I'm just, you know, totally full of myself because I'm <laughs> naming some artists up here at the top. But if, uh, you know, dreams can come true, um, I've recently just learned how great Bob Dylan is. And mm. his, his, the albums that he does of these American standards, these, these, these jazz covers that he's doing, he calls them, he's uncovering them, not just, <laughs> them, but boy. Just to be in the room with him. With, with oh, I know, Bob, yeah. To watch Bob work. What a talent. The other hero of mine, of course, is uh, is Brian Wilson. Um, mm. Just just to be in the room to watch him work, to have to have anything to do with what he's doing, it would would be beyond thrilling. I also am a huge fan of Lana Del Rey. I love Lana. Oh, Del Rey. she's a fantastic artist. Oh, I love Lana. What a great lyric writer. Uh, my friend Rick Knowles out there in Los Angeles has worked with her quite a bit, and he oh, tells. Nice. She's just as brilliant as you think she is. I'll bet. Wow. I love Father John Misty, huge Father John Misty fan. I, of course, I'd name the obvious, like Kendrick Lamar, an artist like that, but there'd be nothing for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect as it is. I can't imagine anything that I would bring to the table that would make that work any more perfect than it is. But, of course, we all have these fantasies. Which brings brings up a point. A producer will often do her or his best work working with artists we don't think are perfect. If you think it's perfect, you're not going to add much of anything. Mm, that's a good point. Uh -huh. think, yeah, there's room for me here. You're going to find the spot where you can make a contribution that is, as I said earlier, going to fan this thing out change its shape in a way that will be desirable. That's what you're looking for. How can I contribute something that is actually kind of needed? Um, that's, that's when you'll do your, your best work. Yeah. I think that's so applicable in, in any area in life. That's actually a really good lesson. Yeah. And, 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 oh, sorry. and Michelle <laughs> asked another question. I know I'm throwing the wrong person here. Um, <laughs> Michelle asked another question that I wish I had come up with. I wish I had asked. How did you get interested in auditory memory? Like, where did that, that initial spark come from? Well, I think it's when I studied it and I realized I have never, in any class I've taken in college, ever attempted to understand anything this difficult. Now, uh, the difficult classes in college are going to be physics and they'll be philosophy. Organic chemistry is really hard for many. Um, uh, calculus is hard for some. There isn't a single thing I studied that was harder than memory. It is beastly difficult. One of the reasons why it's so difficult is because we think we know it. We think we know what memories are. But consider this for just a second. If I ask you to picture your bedroom when you were 10 years old, <laughs> picture your bedroom when you were 10 years old, and if you follow the instruction and you do actually get a mental image of your bedroom, where the window was in relation to the bed and uh, if there were posters on the wall or what the floor looked like or uh, where you kept your stuff. If you're picturing your room, what just happened? What just happened? All uh, kinds right. of neurons are firing, yes. Yes, but I, I planted the words bedroom 10 years old you were you have to be motivated you were a willing spirit let's presume and you went ahead and thought of it you reactivated a pattern of neural activity that could
crudely corresponds to your bedroom when you were 10 years old. So <laughs> if you were sitting on your bed when you were 10, you were, uh, you'd be seeing certain things. And there'd be a pattern of activity that corresponds to what you're seeing. If that's going to be remembered later, that pattern needs to be tagged with a protein. Mm-hmm. It's actually mm-hmm. called the, it's, it's kinase, alpha calmodulin kinase, but it needs to be tagged with a protein so that you want it later, you can reactivate it. How that happens, well, it takes place in the center of the brain, and it involves something called the enterorhinal cortex, and it involves the hippocampus and all these little structures. But it takes a pattern, and your brain is going through the process, and um, it's saying, remember this for later, and it's attaching proteins to that pattern and then making it just kind of go away until you need it again. Uh How that happens and how we can study thoughts in the brain is ridiculous. A thought has a physical correlate. It's a a pattern of activity. Think about the people that study (laughs) physicality of thoughts, and you'll recognize just how difficult memory is. Uh, We can't, you can't, you you know, you want to remember everything you learned in school, but you can't. You uh, can employ certain tricks to try to remember it, mostly just like writing it down. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard, really hard to understand. And oh, it's no fascinating stuff. Geniuses who study it. Yes, I, I think probably one of my favorite subjects in college, because I was a psych major, was sensation and perception and cognition. And I spent out. I could have spent whole days in that class because I would send and spend time in that class, and it almost was in many ways a philosophy class. Because you were thinking about thinking in the metacognition behind the be, behind metacognition even, um, and and the ideas of like well everything that I'm sensing right now is it real is it not real based on just the fact that these five senses are picking everything up and then I'm you know every single person has a different view of what's exactly going on. Like I said, I could have spent days <laughs> in each of those classes because it just brought on so much thought mm. and so much introspection, um, and it was one of my favorite classes of all time. I like that sensation and perception too. And I just happened to have a great teacher in it. So uh, it was especially good. I have an engineering mind, which makes me very attracted to neuroscience. Uh, I like thinking about systems and thinking about how things interconnect. And if you remove that one part, like how would it behave differently? I, I love systems. It's the kind of thinker I am. But other thinkers are more theoretical and philosophical. They're really, really smart, and I wish I was one of them. But I'm, I'm good with the neuroscience. That's kind of the street I live on. A bit. So I have to ask now that I've been hearing this conversation, Susan, do you do things in your lab, like hook people up to fMRI and play different intervals and things like that? Or is that something you'd like to do? <laughs> uh, I do hook people up, but it's not to fMRI. Those tools... <laughs> just to cost millions of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm at a teaching college, not at a research institution, so I don't have access to any of that fancy e- stuff. EEG maybe? or um... Yes, that's what I have. I have EEG. And um, so I bring people into the laboratory and they can sit in the comfy chair and I can put stick the electrodes, which is like a contact mic, and you just stick mm-hmm. it right here on the forehead for the ground wire and then you stick two more on these bones. If you'll feel behind your ear, you'll feel there the, the mastoid bones right behind your ear, you can stick these electrodes there and then you give people these really expensive etymotic earphones and you you have them sit back in the chair and then they listen to, well, it can be an extreme clicks or it can be tones or intervals and, and this measures the auditory brainstem response. I can measure the output of the cochlea and I can also measure what's going on in the cortex. I don't get much time for research for a couple of reasons. One is I'm at a teaching college and they don't give us time for research. And I am getting kind of close to retirement now. So I'm just focusing on teaching and doing like talks like these. And I travel a lot and talk about prints and talk about music in the brain. And I'll get, into, I'll get back into the lab this summer. And that'll be fun. 
<laughs> Very cool. Well, you know, I'll have to see if I can. Uh, do you have a, a Twitter or something where we can, people can follow you and keep up with your research and your talks and such? Or? Well, being uh, being someone who's trying to find time for the laboratory, <laughs> I do not have Facebook. I do not have Twitter. I do not have Instagram. I have zero participation in social media uh, because I don't have anything I want to publish. <laughs> So people should just kind of Google your name and uh, try and figure out what's going on with you next and try and, because I, I don't know, I, I personally would love to uh, keep up with what you're doing. Well, that's nice to hear. Um, usually the way um, I get to talk about what I'm doing is with an invited talk. Uh, I, I just returned from Ottawa the weekend before last where I participated in Megaphono and uh, I'll be giving you have got a lot of talks coming up in, in March and um, the more in May. Some of them are in the United States, but some of them are in Canada and Australia and in Europe. And um, and that's really, really, really fun for me. I get to talk about oh, that sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that I've been researching or that I've been investigating. One of them is uh, the neurobiology of creativity. I've been very, very excited about that. And I enjoy talking with other recording engineers and record producers about where where our ideas come from, you know, and what we're doing when we're listening to a performer play and we're making this assessment about whether or not that performance is good enough and whether or not that, that sound, that tone is good enough. And it's a constant running stream of judgment. Most of the time it's no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm no. familiar with that, yeah. <laughs> you the thing that you want and then suddenly it crosses a psychological boundary and goes mm. from no to, to yes. yes. But where that boundary comes from is interesting to me and also the fact that it's different for every individual brain. A perfect moment that illustrates this is in the great documentary Muscle Shoals. You know, I've, I can't get enough of watching that movie, but in the movie Mus Muscle Shoals, the late, great Rick Hall, one of my absolute heroes of all time, would spend, according to Candy Stanton, would spend three days in the studio saying no, 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 no. Oh, and by the way, he's working with the Swampers. Like he's working <laughs> at the same studio with the Swampers with some of the, the greatest rhythm sections ever to come out of anywhere on earth. And he's got this great talent. He's got Candy Stanton. He's got Percy Sledge. He's got these Aretha Franklin. He's got this great oh, talent. Wow, yeah. Why was it no for three days? What <laughs> is he listening for? And that man, Rick Hall, single-handedly was turning out as many hits as Los Angeles and New York. Yeah. Uh, oh, incredible. Shoals, Alabama. Because... <laughs> His template for what good was was so perfectly mm. formed. When Greg Wells came to visit our campus here a few years back, uh, I just love Greg Wells to death. And uh, he was giving an open talk to the students, and he's talking about working with Katy Perry and what do they call 21 Pilots and all the many, many artists he works with. And he looked at our Berkeley students and he said, You guys sitting here, you have no idea how good good is. And I just nodded my head. Guys, yeah. school, wait till you get out there and you hear how good, good <laughs> it is. Wait till you work with a Tyler Stewart or a Jim Cregan or Greg Wells. Wait till you, Katie Lang. <laughs> mm -hmm. I recorded her once and I'll oh, never cool. the sound that came out of, came out of her, out of her throat. I, the, the, she warmed up for two hours to do just four lines on a uh, Wendy and Lisa album. I'd never recorded anything like that in my life. When that tone came up out of her chest and into that microphone. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, you have no idea how good good is. The good has to come from somewhere. <laughs> So there is another podcast that covers bare naked ladies. Um, we're we're pretty good friends with them, um, and so it's all been done. And they said, I asked them. I was like, we're going to be talking with Susan this week. Do you have any questions? That, and they they sent me one. Um, I'm going to do my best to read it because he he also is a music geek over there. Um, so uh, he says, I'd like to be curious to ask her about the volume wars of the mid '90s, where every CD was oh, mixed no, at the yeah. maximum volume possible. 
and whether you were pressured by your studio to do the same thing with stunt or if you felt it performed better at a reasonable level it and was why. The loudness wars because volume and loudness are two different oh, okay. things. <laughs> the loudness wars. Uh, nobody needed to pressure me. I'll tell you exactly <laughs> what happened. So we would get test pressings for vinyl to check out, and you'd also get a test pressing for a CD. And uh, with vinyl, in the, in the 80s, we didn't have that loudness war going on. But by the time we got into the 90s, here's exactly what happens. You're a producer, right? And you've uh, just received the test pressing of the band that you're very excited to have worked with and you're anticipating that your single is going to be a hit and you've got that cd and you put it in your cd player you set the volume to a comfortable level you hit play you listen to it you assess it for uh, how it sounds and it sounds pretty good it sounds pretty good great you hit eject you bring that cassette or that cd out of the drive you put in someone else's cd just for comparison to make sure that you know your judgment is correct and theirs comes on louder. And what you do as a producer is you have your Scarlett O'Hara moment where you're shaking <laughs> your fist at the sky going, oh, this is my witness, this will never happen to me again. <laughs> you want to be competitive. Yeah. And you, uh, the, the band is calling you and they're asking, why isn't this loud enough? And you're, you're saying, there's no excuse. It's on me. I blame myself. So the next time you mix, you start dialing up that stereo compressor and you start asking your mastering engineer, crank it, crank it for me. I want it loud. <laughs> we all did it. And it was an arms race. We all did it because we wanted our stuff to pop on radio in the 90s. And we know that people prefer things that are louder when you compare to sound files, people will choose the louder one as being the better one. Uh, it took us a long time to dial that back, but it was really easy to get into and really, really hard to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, the over squashing sounds terrible, and of course, I had an ear for fidelity, and so I don't want it to be over squashed. But I can tell you that when we add a lot of compression, what we're doing is we're ironing out those dynamic changes. And essentially what that does is it allows us to listen to music for longer because it's not dynamic and it's not waking us up. So there are pros and cons to having hyper-compressed audio. When it's really compressed, you can put it on in the car or you can put it on at the club or like gym, the health club, right? And it won't disturb you. And you'll listen to the whole record top to bottom. But if it's constantly getting louder and softer and louder and softer and you're having to play with that volume knob, it's going to take more effort to listen to. Mm. So this happened. This happened. Yeah. And so that probably goes into what you were mentioning on another, another uh, interview as well. In that the more times that you listen to something that's neutral or like, you get to like that more until it, it hits a certain saturation. Yes. And so if it's if it's louder, if it's com if it's compressed more, then you listen to it more often. Can listen to it more often. You're going to like Good it more. Point. Good point. That's Berlin's 1971 theory of liking and how familiarity influences liking. Um, when hmm. things saturate the marketplace, the odds are really good that often we're going to hear a song that we have no particular feeling for. We're going to hear it when we're in a really good mood, feeling really good. Might be out, I don't know, you're shopping or you're eating in a restaurant or you're having a good time, you're visiting with friends at a bar or something, and that song comes on and you're feeling really good. And the whole brain is encoding that song. So as that song is activating your cortex, so are the sights, sounds, smells, and the endorphins, the feelings, the neurotransmitters. I feel great. And then later, when you hear that song in another setting, you might get a little trickle just a little trickle that might remind you of those people. You might not even consciously know why. It might remind you of what you were eating, or it might just make you feel good a little bit. That's, yep. th th those things just kind of developed like that. That happens for me with stunt. Stunt mm -hmm. was was at a perfect spot in my life, and it, it's still a music that I think I would have liked anyways, but it hit me at the time in my life when I was out and 
it was in my grad school years. It was my late college years where I was enjoying and out listening to stuff, not in the bar, but we'd go to the pool halls and just play pool all night with me and my fellow grad students and just sit there and talk theories. And so that was always playing in the background. We always had stunt as our background to our grad school years. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it brings up all those happy memories from that time. Yeah, so you can form an association with happiness, and then if you're willing to expend the effort and really focus in on it, you might hear things that cause you to bond to it. Either the rhythm is grooving, or those melodies just get stuck in your head that you just absolutely love, or maybe the lyrics have solved a problem for you. You had mentioned imprinting earlier, Mm. and that's very, very important, especially for teenagers for helping us to bond to music. When we're teenagers, we're trying to solve all these social problems, and we're often lonely and sad and confused. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to think. So we put on a record, and the singer tells us, here's what to think. Mm. Here's what to say. Here's what to do. And that's comforting. And we bond and get attached to someone who's a caregiver and is taking care of us when we're sick or hurting or sad. So you can form... um, tight, tight bonds that last for life to um, a a musical artist that has taken care of you when you needed it. It usually happens when we're teens, but it can happen when we're older, too. Yeah. Well put. Do you have other questions, Aaron? Uh, I know we're trickling down time. We've used up a lot of your time, Susan. I really appreciate that. I'm just basking in the glow of this amazing conversation we've had. No, I think think I'm pretty much... uh, Pretty much satisfied. Um, Susan Rogers, it has been entertaining, it has been informative, and it has been extremely... I'm not going to... Before you go and cut us... Oh, I'm, sure. I'll let you do your wrap-up. Oh, I'll let sorry. you do the wrap-up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do have one more question for you. If... A little bit of an intro to it. If you listen... <laughs> You, the listeners, listen to the interview on the Berkeley website, which I will post, and I highly recommend it, as I don't want to repeat all the questions that they have on this interview. You talk about, Susan, how you decided to get into musical engineering, and you sent away to the Army for their training manuals on electronics. You taught yourself. Uh, you sold yourself to the uh, the audio industries as a trainee on the MCI machines by pushing your credentials and even kind of like being overly enthusiastic at times about what you have and, and what you had to bring to it. Your favorite art artist was Prince and you saw the opening as a tech engineer and you, you so you just went for it, but you were also a really hard worker and a, and a learner. Is it fair to say that your life hasn't been so much about luck, but it's about I'm going to reach for what I want and I'm going to commit myself to it. I'm going to believe in myself. I think so. There's a a book that was released in October of last year that talks about exactly that. And I'm featured very heavily in the book. It's by a couple of Harvard researchers. It's called Dark Horse. The Pursuit, wait a minute, Pursuit of Success Through Fulfillment or, yeah, it's essentially that. But it's called Dark Horse by these Harvard researchers uh, pursuing success through fulfillment. Um, The lead author is Todd Rose, like the flower rose. Anyway, they're interested in people who have not set out to be successful, but who have set out to be fulfilled. And in achieving fulfillment, Mm -hmm. they just happen to become successful. But it was never what they were chasing. They weren't chasing the standard covenant of, well, I got to have this I got to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30, and I've got to have this degree, and I've got to achieve this, and I've got to have. I had zero interest in any of those things. I was passionate about the work. I wanted my body to be where my mind already was. And where my mind was, was thinking about records. I wanted to be where records were being made. And if someone could pay me, if there was anything I could do to be where records were being made, I'd be happy. So I taught myself to be, uh, I taught myself electronics, and then, of course, I got in with some of the best technicians out there in Los Angeles who taught me to repair consoles and tape machines. Hmm. They taught me and took my youthful enthusiasm, and, and they used it to their advantage. You know, they taught, they taught me. And um, that is what I've been able to parlay. The, this thing that I naturally do, I can exchange that for the opportunity to be where I want to be. I did the same thing when I left the music business and got into 
the sciences because my fantasies started shifting from being in the studio to being in the laboratory. I just thought I would really like that. And I was right. I do really like that. <laughs> I like it very much. I've always just pursued fulfillment, and, and that's all I've ever thought about. It's been very fun. Well, I think that's definitely the right way to go. Uh, Susan, actually, that reminds me. Is it true that you earned your high school diploma at 44? I did, yeah. That's I was, amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I never finished high school. Uh, my mother passed away from a uh, long illness when I was a teenager, and it was kind of was every man for himself at that point. My poor father, who was a very good man, uh, got remarried in order to help uh, stabilize the home life, but it was just kind of a mess. So I, I just left. I left home, and I got married when I was 17 years old. And the marriage didn't work out. Fortunately for me, uh, so, and, yeah. Fortunately, and I'm, yeah. I'm, I would have had a different life if it had. Very different, I would imagine. Yeah, it was a bad marriage and a bad idea. So I got out of it when I was 21. But um, the whole music business career, I didn't need a high school diploma. But in order to get into college, I needed one. So I had to study and and take that test and get that diploma. That's uh, incredible to me. And it, like, I think it's so important that people hear stories like that, because so many people get caught in that rut of, it's too late, I can't do this. Uh, and you know, look at you, someone who was just completely self made and just pulled yourself up by your bootstraps and made built a career from the ground up, then went to high school, got your diploma. Now, you're a doctor of psychology, you're a professor at Berkeley, you, you tour the world giving these talks. Um, what an incredible life, and, and, and thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you for your questions and for letting me go down memory lane about some of the happiest memories I've ever had. Uh, I thanked Bare Naked Ladies in the um, acknowledgments page of my doctoral thesis. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. All of that was possible, thanks to them and the success that I enjoyed with them. I had successful records before, but not commercially successful, artistically successful, but I'd never done a big pop record before until until those guys. My career, my degree would not have been possible if it hadn't been for them. So they deserve then and now my deepest gratitude. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, and you deserve our deep gratitude for coming Indeed. to our podcast. Indeed. We really appreciate the conversation that we've had. We can this spend is, hours talking yeah, with you yeah. because you are so entertaining and interesting. I'd love to just pick interesting. your brain and listen yeah. to it. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, your time, your knowledge, and your stories with us. You're welcome anytime. Nice to Do you talk. mind if I take a quick picture real quick and, oh, yeah. and, and use that <laughs> on our page? Would that be okay? Sure. The, 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 the light in my room is not too good. Do you want me to send you a picture or do you want to take a picture? Um, it, it is okay. We can take one. Like I got good okay. I got a good picture here. Okay. <laughs> you, do you want to smile, Aaron? <laughs> I don't smile, Tracy. You don't smile. <laughs> I'm a musician. <laughs> I got you laughing, so that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's horrible on me. All right. There we go. It's good no, for me because you got half of, my face. <laughs> half of my face is outside the picture. <laughs> Again, thank you so much, Susan. We really appreciate it. It's been wonderful. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, guys. Have a good night. Nice to meet you. You too. Wonderful to meet you. Have a good night. Okay, bye. (laughs) See ya. Thanks. That was fun. Don't forget. No regrets. Except maybe one. To celebrate joining Pantheon Podcasts, Rock Camp, the podcast, the official podcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, is giving away a guitar signed by Mike Portnoy of Dream Theater, Marty Friedman, formerly of Megadeth, and legendary shredder Zach Wild, plus our rock star counselors like Vinny Apice, Monty Pittman, and more. To enter to win, simply follow, rate, and review our podcast on your preferred platform, and that's all you have to do. For more information, go to rockcamp.com forward slash podcast.